All right, I would like to, uh, to welcome everybody to this uh, CCP conversation on the uh, uh, proposed DMA. Uh, the topic of this conversation is what obligations should be placed on large online gatekeepers? Have the EC Digital Markets Act proposals got it right? Uh, today, we're going to be uh, holding a, uh, a panel discussion uh, of, this, uh, of this question with some, uh, some leading, leading academics and also uh, Mike Walker from the CMA who has uh, joined us and replaced Jenny Haydock. In particular, we're joined by, uh, from the CCP, uh, Damien Gerardin, who's, whose idea this conversation initially was, uh, Amelia Fletcher, Kayuve Kuhn, and we're also joined by Howard Schlansky uh, from, from Georgetown, who has some uh, CCP links that go back in time as well. Um, and uh, and what, we're, uh, what I'd like to do before we start is just to uh, introduce people who haven't been exposed to the CCP to, to what it is um, and, uh, and, and just uh, describe what, we, what we're about. We are a leading interdisciplinary center uh, for research that's focused on competition, regulation, and consumer policy. Uh, we actually have uh, approximately 40 academics uh, at the university itself, where we're based at the University of East Anglia, who are uh, members of the CCP. And we have a number of affiliates who are from, from outside the university as well. We bring together experts, government officials, and practitioners from the fields of business, economics, law, and political science to create and communicate high quality research. Uh, the CCP conversation series is designed to provide an academic discussion on a current real world policy question or development. Um, and this is the second conversation in our series. So what I'd, uh, uh, the, the reason we chose today's topic is that it is obviously of of uh, very, very high importance in Europe um, and, uh, and other parts of the world as well, how, how uh, digital markets may end up uh, being, being regulated. And, uh, and now there's some specific and concrete proposals on the table, and that's what we wanted to discuss with the group today. Um, uh, so the, uh, the current status uh, of this, uh, proposal is just that, it's a proposal. Um, it is not yet uh, European Union uh, legislation, uh, but, uh, but I think that this conversation is one that I hope will be able to, uh, to live on in time, uh, even, even after there is, is legislation. So I hope you can keep your comments to, uh, to be ones that would have some, some lasting interest uh, even after the legislation is passed. Uh, we're going to be focusing first on talking about some of the objectives, uh, then the, uh, the designation process that's outlined in the, uh, in the legislation, then the obligations themselves, which are absolutely at, at the core of our interest today, and a little, little bit about enforcement methods. Um, and so, uh, so I'd like to start out um, on, on objectives. Uh, the, uh, the legislation uh, discusses having objectives of uh, contestability and fairness. Um, how, how clear are these uh, to you? D does anyone want to comment on uh, the fairness objective, for example? Uh, you know, is that a, is that a well-defined uh, objective for you, or could there be more said about that? Okay, Sean. So I, I think there, there there is. I, I think one of the problems of this legislation is that one has kind of decided to take it uh, completely outside the framework of what we've had before. For example, in, in competition policy, where we had um, relatively clear benchmarks against what we were actually trying to evaluate things, and had a relatively clear idea that we were talking about market power. And so that one could, in a sense, measure um, in terms of price effects and so on and so forth. I think we've taken that uh, away with this and have brought in things that are hard to interpret. And I think also, which I find most problematic, hard to ex post evaluate whether the measures actually have had success on any measurable scale, 
according kind of to those objectives. And, and I think it's, it's actually interesting to just think about the fairness objective a little bit because that word fairness appears in competition policy also on one point, namely essentially excessive pricing, exploitative abuses. And that's where it's, it's caused a lot of difficulties in, in the courts actually and has actually taken us away sometimes from kind of the more reasonable implementation. So, so there, there's now kind of the, often these double tests on which one says, oh, on one side, um, we're testing where the margin is very high. On the other side, we still have to uh, test what is fair. Uh, and then you get into discussions like in, in, in some of the court decisions in the UK, for example, and then said, well, fair, that has to be measured by what economic value is. And economic value isn't an economic concept, it's a legal concept. And then you get some discussion of what is fair in terms of economic value that as an economist, you can't follow anymore and actually changes from, from, from decision to decision. So I, I think the whole concept has a problem of arbitrariness. I think for uh, the concept of contestability as well, because it's not well-defined what actually contestability is. Uh, I think for the measures at the moment, because they're mostly um, per se measures uh, of restrictions, that might not make that much of a difference. But really for us to ask the question, are these measures in the end successful or what are they actually addressing? Uh, I think we're, we're, we're going to have a problem in the long run. And, and I find that very problematic. Uh, I must say I've, I've, I've been very critical about the German reform of the competition law. Uh, but I'm actually more sympathetic to that because you can think more about how you can actually even uh, defend against some of these measures and actually measure up on whether they have made sense ex post or not. And I think that type of ex post evaluation is actually something that's really important for, for regulatory intervention. I, I, think, I think you could say that uh, if, if you fill a room with, with people and you ask them, uh, about what sorts of business activities are fair, you'll very often have at least five different perspectives on what's fair and, and maybe uh, whatever the number of people is in the room is, is the number of perspectives you might have on what counts as fair. So this, mm -hmm. this places a, a, a serious obligation uh, for those who have to evaluate uh, cases on, on how, to, uh, how to arrive at a measure that uh, that's objective enough to be agreed upon by many. Yeah. Any, any other comments on this? Yes, I, I think, I, I mean, I'm much more optimistic or, or at least less pessimistic than Kayuve when it comes to uh, these objectives. And I think it's very important when you think about the objectives to see where the DMA is coming from. Um, I think there was a, a great demand on the side of, uh, you know, business users or users of platform services, um, you know, with respect to two things. I, I, I think, first of all, um, they wanted to be protected against some form of leveraging. I think if you look at the obligations, many of them echo some of the competition cases we've seen in the last uh, decade. And then they also uh, wanted uh, obligations that would protect them against exploitation um, in the sense that, you know, platforms with significant market power can impose, you know, a range of conditions that are unfavorable to uh, these business users. So I think that um, we should not be too bogged down on concepts such as uh, contestability and fairness. Actually, if you look at the obligations, the word fair is only used once, if I'm not misguided, and it's, uh, it's in Article 6K. The other obligations are actually quite concrete, right? So I don't think it's a fair criticism to say, oh, it's all about fairness and it's completely vague. We don't know what we're talking about. No, I don't think it's correct. I think the reference to fairness is linked to the one of exploitation and the need to protect business users against 
exploitation. The, the final point I, I'd like to make is that I'm not sure we should refer to the competition law, you know, concepts or framework when we look at the DMA. For me, it's a new set of tools. And you, you will have noticed that, in fact, the CMA is moving away from the traditional concept of competition law. It, there's no reference. If you look at designation, it's not by reference to markets or market power. So I think we have to be a little bit cautious when we try to use competition law concepts and, and you know, place them in the context of the DMA. I think it is, and more importantly, it should be a, a different set of tools. Yeah, if I could build on what Damian just said, because I, I was having similar thoughts listening to Kayuve's remarks. And, you know, the perspective that I come to on the draft uh, legislation, drawing on the American experience, is that this feels a lot more to me like the Telecommunications Act of 1996 than like antitrust law. And in that particular case, we had a set of private but regulated enterprises, which is a distinction, but uh, I'm not sure it really matters here, where there was clear and durable incumbency. Now that may be one of the differences here, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But there was an effort to interject competition into these local exchange markets through a series of contestability measures, the terms of which were effectively phrased in terms of fairness. That, that wasn't the word that the statute used. But the real question was, who should bear fixed costs that were still being amortized in the legacy network? And I think that has some real parallels here to some of the conditions. And the fairness argument from the incumbents was, we invested in all of this infrastructure anybody who is making use of this infrastructure because they are granted that right by statute and we have the obligation to allow access up to a certain point should have to share in those costs. And ultimately, the Federal Communications Commission upheld in court all the way up to the Supreme Court, um, imposed a, a measure of access that effectively said to the incumbents, you've been benefiting for a really long time. You've had years and years of profits that, though being regulated, have been supra-competitive. And the fact that others are going to be able to come onto your network at forward-looking incremental cost um, is only fair because it is the only way we will get true contestability. And ultimately, there was sort of a decision made that you've enjoyed the benefits of incumbency. Without these measures, incumbency will last and endure, and uh, you know, as will dominance and monopoly. So we're going to do some things that, by the terms of competition policy, look wrong. You're not getting to fully profit to the fullest extent from your past investments. We're going to make judgments about what pricing is fair or what terms of access are fair. Even if we don't quite use that word, it's fair in terms of what will enable contestability. And so to me, it's very much a regulatory framework that comes from sort of the revolution we saw in regulatory policy in the 1990s of shifting from containing monopoly to enabling competition. And I view this as a form of competition enabling legislation. Now, that leaves open two big questions. When you don't have a set of pre-existing regulated entities whose monopoly you have decades of experience with and will be able to clearly predict will endure, you do have a designation problem. And I know that's one of the, or a designation challenge. And that's one issue we will turn to. And then the extent of what constitutes unfairness, the terms, if you will, of conduct are going to be challenging because it may be less clear what is beneficial for society and for competition, hence Caillou point about how do we evaluate this ex post. But this feels to me like a sort of modern form of a regulatory approach that I don't judge by the standards of competition policy. Okay, thank I, I think you. it's a bit misinterpreting thing what I said, because I, I think 
the, the competition policy that I'm bringing in, and that was what's classic regulatory issue as well, was one of pricing and exercise of market power. And that was very clearly measurable. We, we have here dimensions in there, I don't think that are so much measurable. And the issue is also we have a much more complex web of complementarities where the issues of purely distributional effects relative to incentive effects are much less clear. So a lot of the fairness is, is really about the distribution of rents on complements, which wasn't the issue in the deregulation of telecoms, where it came in where when, when then people said, look, you have to completely debundle uh, every little link because I want to provide that link. And that became problematic in that context. Uh, but, but I think there's a fundamental difference here. And, uh, it, you know, the measures are very clear and, and very per se, but that means for me that the, the ex post evaluation issue is a really important one. And I don't see what the benchmark is going to be for that. Uh, that was much clearer in that earlier regulatory reform uh, that we're talking about. So I, I'm essentially in the same place as Damien and, and Howard. And I think the thing is that although sharing of rents may, may be an outcome of this regulation, I don't think the fairness of the rent sharing is really key. It is in traditional regulation, but here it's more about fair treatment of firms, which will thereby enable greater contestability, greater competition, and will thereby lead to a fairer rent sharing. So there are there is a fr one friend element in there, which is clearly to do with price. But mostly, if you think about the obligation, which says you must, mustn't stop people from complaining to public authorities when you have complaints, that's nothing to do with price. That's just about fairness. That's a minor, minor issue there. So. And let's, uh, I mean, it is something that, that, uh, that has been uh, in the contracts between uh, some large platforms and, and their providers. Um, let, let's, uh, let's move on and let's talk about the designation uh, uh, aspect of this uh, proposal. Uh, uh, unless, Mike, did you want to come in? I, I couldn't see if, if you. I mean, I was just going to say that. I mean, actually, I think this is a bit of a red herring as to exactly what they mean by um, contestability and fairness, because you know, if you, I mean, I think Damien, Damien made the point. I mean, you, you read the obligations and it's pretty clear what they're after. They're worried about the ability to restrict the exercise of current market power and about opening up, uh, opening up these markets in order to over time undermine that market power. I mean, that seems to me to be Right. And I agree with Kaiva that when you start talking about fairness, it becomes a bit of a nightmare. And when you get to court, it's a nightmare. But in terms of actually what the objectives are here, I mean, I think it's pretty clear. You know, restrict excise current market power, undermine future market power, and an implicit acceptance in all of that that antitrust has, has failed here. And obviously, that's, that's right. So, I mean, I think that's pretty, you know, we, we shouldn't get too hung up on the exact wording, at least not until we get to court. Okay, so so let's move on then to the uh, to the designation process, and I wonder if we could begin, Amelia, uh, with just a, a short description of, of the designation process that's proposed. Okay, so hopefully you can see that. Yeah. Um, I thought it was worth just putting this in front of people because maybe people haven't seen this in detail. This is the designation process that's proposed. Um, a lot of people have focused on the quantitative designation uh, uh, criteria that I've put in the green box here, which basically say you will, there will be a rebuttable presumption that you should be um, designated if you have high enough turnover, if you have enough both end users and business users, and if you have had those many business users uh, and end users for the last three years. Um, and there's been a lot of focus on that and discussion about which firms fall into that and which firms don't fall into that. I wanted to just highlight that that is one, albeit very, very important um, part of the designation process. In fact, the real criteria are those in the amber box here, which is that you have to be significant. You have to operate a core platform service, which is an important gateway for business users to reach end users. Um, so definitely that 
that two-sided aspect and you have to have an entrenched and durable position or be going to have that in the foreseeable future um and the basically what you can any firm can go through those criteria and get through the designation gate in theory what the green box does is for a number relatively small number of the very biggest firms allows a kind of broadband fast access into the into the gate without having to go through the detailed analysis um for and I and there is still discussion going on about exactly who falls under those criteria but I think it is really very few of the very biggest firms that we all know even then they do have the potential for rebuttal so they can say actually even though we meet these qualitative these quantitative criteria we think you need to we don't think we meet the actual designation criteria so please revisit and in applying those criteria you have to look at some of the same things so things like size number of users but also entry barriers scale and scope effects lock-in etc so there's it's quite complicated i think the aim is to very easily get in the very very biggest players um but not to limit themselves completely to give a bit more flexibility over time to have more players than meet those qu quantitative criteria but if really justified and just to highlight one other aspect which is this thing in paragraph seven which i've put under the gate which is even if you're designated you the obligations only apply to the relevant core platform service, which itself has to satisfy uh, 3.1b. So basically it has itself to be an important gateway for business users. And I think that's really important because for example, if you have Facebook, for example, um, they might uh, well uh, be designated. I would expect them to be designated, but on the basis of their social network, but for example, their marketplace where they're competing directly with Amazon, but it's not very big yet, maybe that wouldn't be a relevant core platform service that the obligations would be applied to. So I hope that's at least a useful start to the discussion. Well, if I, if I can comment on this, um, uh, thanks Emilia for, for the presentation. Um, I, I think that um, it's important when we when we speak about this proposal generally uh, to to pay some attention to the um, impact assessment report because you've seen the impact assessment report that the commission was working on the basis of three options uh, a sort of non flexible one uh, where for example designation would have been based only on quantitative criteria a semi flexible one option two which is the one that has uh, you know, found its way in the proposal and a completely flexible one whereby assessment would have been made on the basis of qualitative criteria. Um, and, and so here we've got a mix. I think you know, the, the way the commissions put, put this together is quite clever, right? Because it's true that if you focus only on qualitative criteria, then designation may become a, a very challenging process. Um, uh, but at the same time, I think the downside is that it may capture companies that in fact are not gatekeepers, right? I mean, some have done the, the, the math and it seems that it will capture between, you know, 10 to 15 companies. Some of them are clear gatekeepers. I will not, you know, uh, designate them, but uh, I think they will recognize themselves. But some of them are not. Um, necessarily gatekeepers. I mean, you can see platforms that are just big, but may, where you may have multi-homing on both sides, for example. And then I think the question will be the extent to which, you know, the, the sort of exemption approach, you know, platforms that, that fall within the thresholds can make, you know, substantiated arguments will be one where you have a real chance to be taken out or will be very, very strict and narrow. And if you look at the impact assessment report, you see that sometimes they refer to in exceptional circumstances. Well, I'm not so sure that it should be really exceptional. I mean, I think that, you know, you, you, 
I mean, the commission will have to be reasonable about this, right? Um, I, I think in some cases, you know, companies will just fall in because of their size. But um, I don't think they will necessarily pose the sort of gatekeeping problems that are at the source uh, of this piece of legislation. So, you know, that, that's the point I wanted to make. Yeah, just to add a couple of, of comments. Um, and I should disclose that, well, Sean introduced me with my academic affiliation at Georgetown. I also practice law and have represented uh, Facebook. So uh, just so you have that knowledge as you listen to my comments. Um, but I'm of course speaking completely in my personal and academic uh, capacity and these are purely my views. Um, I think the designation poses inevitable problems of over-inclusive and under-inclusiveness. And I would, I would frame it this way, although this is sort of a, a coarse framing. As Demian said, there are gonna be some very large enterprises that might have small pockets in which they are gatekeepers. You know, many of these large platforms uh, provide many different services and functions. And as to some of them, they are not gatekeepers at all. And as to others, they may be, and they will be gatekeepers as to different things. One may be a gatekeeper in messaging, one might be a gatekeeper in something else. Designating the platform as a whole as a as a as a gatekeeper, therefore, will inevitably be over inclusive, because it will include lots of functions into which they are not gatekeepers. I'm not sure how big a problem that is. I'll come back to sort of what will determine maybe how big a problem that is. But on the side of under inclusiveness, if we simply went to a size or market share test that will be under-inclusive because there are some markets in which you may have three or four large vertically integrated players, each of which has an ecosystem into which customers are captive in the aftermarket and contestability in that aftermarket is extremely difficult. And they may say, well, I only have 20% market share or 30% market share, but that could be 20 or 30% of the market. That is not contestable. So you, in some sense, have a terminating monopoly problem with the customers once they have locked into that ecosystem. If you simply had a market share test, you would not include such, uh, such platforms as gatekeepers. And so there, tends, there, there, there are, are risks in designation. And a question came through the Q&A queue a minute ago, I thought it was a very good one. Do you do a market study every time? <laughs> and try to come to a conclusion, then is it rebutted? That's a massive regulatory uh, enterprise that could stymie the whole purposes of the legislation. So one thing that I think, I think designation and how important it is and how important the under-inclusiveness and over-inclusiveness are in the end depends very much on process and what the process is for exiting designation. Um, and to the extent that um, there is a sort of ongoing review process and one can exit from designation or be designated in a more granular way, yes as to function A, no as to function B, the less concern I would have about sort of an off the cup, you're very large, you're sort of one of the four or five companies that would seem obviously to fall under the legislation, you can contest, but in the interim of the contesting, you are subject to the obligations, but there's a robust process to narrow down the degree of the designation. So I think that that process for exiting and refining designation uh, is, uh, is going to determine how big a problem over-inclusiveness or under-inclusiveness is. Maybe if I, I can say something about this, because this is this is exactly the point uh, where some of my skepticism comes in and what we have here, which is process. Uh, so all I'm seeing in process here is actually a very large degree of discretion of the commission in the end in deciding what criteria, because they're, they're the free criteria there to, to what to, to apply, what not to apply, how to interpret whether on that criterion it's really important or not so important. And I think just in, in terms of, of the history of, of, of regulation and also of competition policy um, in the last 20 years, 
um, we've, we've kind of flipped away from being very concerned about excessive discretion of competition authorities and regulators. Um, you know, I, I, I know my, my contributions to the discussion uh, and the reform of the merger regulations were all about, um, you know, self-confirmation of, of regulatory authorities, the difficulties that were there and the lack of checks and balances in the process. And so in order to have a good process, you do need some agreements on benchmarks that are also reviewable so that you're not just dependent on the unilateral decisions of a regulatory authority that in the EU is also a political institution. And there, there was for a long time in competition policy, the critique that, that you know, the, the competition uh, intervention wasn't completely separate from, from policy. I didn't think that was a problem with competition policy because there were very tight criteria on how to decide and, and, and that to be reviewed. And so, so politics had a, had a limited influence. I, I think this is becoming more of a problem here where the discretion is becoming bigger and a lot of the motivation is also so very political. So, so what I'm missing is a clear idea of how the process works and how some of the standards would actually be reviewable. Yeah, I mean, do you think the, uh, the criteria, uh, well, does anyone want to respond to Kaiove's point there first? I mean, I, it would be reviewed every two years is actually one of the process points. And there is the ability to, if, if you fall under the quantitative criteria, to ask to be reviewed under the qualitative cr criteria, etc. So I think there is a fair degree of process in there that they've thought about. I think my worry is whether the qualitative criteria um, may be over inclusive um, on their own. So for example, in the UK, there is a requirement about market power, entrenched market power. There isn't a market power aspect. There's just an entrenched market position, um, which could potentially be over inclusive. Likewise, we're quite concerned, I think, really about ecosystems. So firms that are actually active in at least one of these core, uh, at least a couple of these core platform uh, services. Um, and some, Sarah, Sarah the uh, think tank, have, have suggested that actually your activity in, in a couple of them ought to be a criterion as well. And, and I can see the merit of that. In the UK, uh, again, the CMA has gone for this kind of strategic significance kind of gets at that uh, ecosystem aspect in a slightly um, slightly fuzzy way. Um, so I think both of the, the real question for me is whether if they get round to applying qualitative criteria, and to be honest, they're going to be so busy dealing with the big firms that fall under the quantitative criteria initially that I suspect this is some way off. But if they get round to designating anyone under the qualitative criteria, that they could be, as set out at the moment, a little over-inclusive. Yeah. If I could just pick on that, I, I think I think it's quite interesting because if you think about it, there are two sets of qualitative criteria. They're the ones in 3.1 and then you've got the ones in 3.6. Because if you want to, you know, uh, provide substantiated arguments, well, then, you know, your arguments have to, you know, to be by reference to the set of qualitative criteria that are mentioned in 6 and in which you know you've got uh, questions of you know dependence questions of entry barriers questions of blocking and and so on and so forth so in fact you know as soon as you try to exit from you know the designation because you meet the thresholds then you're back into you know uh, uh, two sorts of sets of qualitative criteria uh, which will make it quite challenging. As to the way the process will work, to be honest, I'm not sure, right? And I think what would be wise, and it's been suggested by some, would be for the Commission to produce a set of guidelines explaining how, you know, they will, you know, apply the thresholds and the criteria and perhaps also explaining a bit more the process, because I think it's too important to be left to, you know, judgment calls at the last minute. 
can I just come in on that um, ecosystem point? <clears throat> um, because, I mean, one of the differences, as I understand it, between what uh, the EU proposals are and what we do is that for the EU, as I read it, it seems to be it's a, a firm wide thing. Whereas for the UK, we're very clear that your SMS status, your strategic market status, relates to a particular activity that you do. So a firm could easily be, and in fact, we'd expect it for some of them, to have SMS in more than one area. We are then going to have a bespoke set of, of um, code of conduct or, or competitive interventions to deal with those SMS designations. And of course, where there's more than one for a firm, you know, we've got an ecosystem type issue, those interventions will then take account of that ecosystem issue. Now, I don't see within the, and maybe this is coming a little bit to the actual what the obligations are, but I don't see in the EU proposals how they deal with that ecosystem issue at no. all. And I think they, they will have to figure out, it's true, in the UK it's very clear, designation is by reference to a, an activity, which makes sense because if you, I mean, if, you know, think about what Howard said, which is correct, I mean, most of the platforms, they have, you know, uh, uh, gatekeeping positions in some markets, and that can be social network, it can be search engine, it can be an app store. But then they do a range of other things where they may have minimal market positions. So I suppose that, you know, the designation would have somehow to be limited to where these companies have, you know, uh, 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 are basically gatekeepers. Otherwise, I, I think it wouldn't make much sense. So if it's not explicit in the regulation, I think it should be made explicit in the re regulation. So I think, I think it is explicit that the obligations only apply to the relevant gatekeeper, the, the relevant core platform service, uh, right. which has to be itself an important gateway. So that's what 3.7 says. Um, that but but you are designated for the full firm firm but that is the same as in the uk the firm the full firm would be designated so you do you know have reporting obligations etc that go across the full the full firm so I, I don't think that's so different myself but mike's looking skeptical do you think there's a there's a risk that uh, that these criteria can pull in some some companies that nobody would at all be thinking of as as of interest at the moment, at least for, for this topic, it might be some very large conglomerates who have a data aspect to what they do. Um, is, is that a risk? I think one of the things that helps myself is the focus on business users and end users, because some of the companies that you might think might come in are things like uh, Salesforce and SAP and Shopify. And I don't think my, myself that they should be coming in, but I think they probably wouldn't come in because of the need to have a lot of, of both business users and end users. I think, though, that I initially thought end users meant consumers and I was felt comfortable with that protection. When you look in a bit more detail, you see that end users kind of just means not sellers. So it could be business users as buyers. So it is a little bit blurry. And I think that is something that could be clarified if you if we want to make sure we're not getting in the likes of Salesforce. Yeah. Yeah, although, I yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm not sure why we wouldn't want to have in the likes of Salesforce or because a lot of the innovation and contestability issues come in at some intermediate point between a platform and final consumers uh, at home. And I think if we look at the allegations that are laid out in the lawsuit that the state attorneys general in the US have filed against Google on the advertising, uh, uh, the ad tech stack, that largely has to do with things that are completely invisible to consumers. It's not a consumer facing uh, set of markets the way the federal government's case against Google is. Mm -hmm. So I don't see any reason why that locus of competition and innovation isn't as important to all of the objectives that the DMA is trying to achieve um, as the purely user facing. So I do think it likely, and to Sean's question, I think properly applied, 
on the criteria of contestability and I prefer market power to market position, but whatever, even market position, I think it very likely that properly applied, it would sweep in companies where the average consumer at home would say, who? I've never heard of that company because, or I've seen that name somewhere, but I don't use them. No, but the companies that serve you use them. And competition in the, at that level of the stack is extremely important. Now, without making a judgment about whether a Shopify or a Salesforce or any of the companies that you've named um, would qualify, at least as a matter of principle, if they have locked up an ecosystem. And these may well be the verticals in which there are these sort of terminating monopolies as in, in their own aftermarkets. They may well and quite reasonably be swept in by at least the objectives and the plain language of the draft legislation. Yeah, I, I think otherwise it, it would, would simply also not be consistent in, in terms of the logic. So if the logic is that, that you're reaching lots of consumers and therefore it's really uh, it, it, customers on the other side and the intermediary is, is essential for that. I mean, it's, it, it's essentially a, a reformulation of an essential facility type of, type of argument, right? And, and then it should not be dependent on the things that ex ante we think would fall under it, but under something that's an objective criterion. And that doesn't mean whether it's further upstream or further downstream, I think. So, 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 so I think that rather uh, would help the consistency of this. And, and I think it also avoids uh, more another problem, namely that we're thinking about some of these things. And if you look at the list of what, you know, core platform activities are, uh, you see, uh, this is taking GAFAM and looking at all the activities they have and, and write down that list, right? And that's not taking that approach doesn't necessarily give you, I think in the long run, the, the, the areas where you have potentially larger problems. So you don't want to, you're, you're starting to kind of focus on just one part of the economy and kind of leaving out other parts of the economy that can be really important, but, uh, but maybe less visible. I mean, I, I think in privacy, that there's this obvious thing that we're staring at some of the big guys and the ones who are really integrating data uh, in a way that they can track us in a way that's really scary are much smaller companies who are putting data sets together and using that for tracking. Uh, and, and, and no one is discussing that. And, and you kind of think that uh, they're, well, some are discussing it, but not, not kind of in this context, uh, but, but, but they're kind of the, the damage may actually be much larger than somewhere else. And so, so I think um, kind of the more we're getting away from having specific firms in mind and to objective criteria, the better we are off in terms of dealing, dealing with the issues because we're looking at the issues rather than at the firms. Okay, uh, can, I, from, you know. so can I push back a little bit on that? I'm not sure I uh, agree with that because I mean, it seems to me that if these rules are picking up People think like, for instance, potentially Shopify or Salesforce and everything. Then we we that is then that seems to me to underline a, a problem with the with the rules and with the approach. Because it seems to me, what is the problem we're dealing with here? The problem we're dealing with is, I think, uh, a bunch of large digital platforms where antitrust has been shown to fail, and so we think we have to take a regulatory approach. I'm not sure we can say that's true of Spotify, Salesforce, Uber, et cetera, all of which are, are, are caught. So I take your point, Kaive, and which you're clearly right, that you know, in the ideal world, you want to be consistent, you know, you want to be, um, but I think thinking about that is actually leads us to think, okay, this process, these rules are not quite in the right place because when we're consistent, we end up picking up a bunch of firms for which it doesn't seem we've got good evidence that they need regulating. And I think it's less of an issue in the UK system because you'd be doing a, a code of conduct rele, re, relevant to those firms if they did fall under, although arguably, I think for the same reasons as Mike says, we haven't shown that competition law is not sufficient to deal with those firms and therefore arguably they shouldn't be falling under. Um, plus one of the reasons for including the other firms was is one of the ra rationales is around consumer biases and consumers ability to um, uh, really tr drive competition in these markets which arguably d you don't have for some of these uh, these b2b firms but i think the other point i would just want to make is we're going to come on to the obligations in a minute the obligations have 
have been derived from the behavior of some of the biggest firms, there is a process we can go through now and we should be going through, which is thinking about how they apply to the other of the biggest firms and whether there's any potential unintended effects. I think it's a whole nother issue to go through those obligations and think how they might apply to the myriad of other firms that could potentially fall under these regulations um, and what the unintended effects might be there and I just worry that if we if we don't keep the scope pretty tight we end up not being able to actually have very effective obligations because we 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 feel they can't be they can't be as tight as 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 they need to be for the big firms because that would be detrimental for as yet unspecified other firms um, if, uh, can I do, sorry, uh, can I pick up on the under-inclusiveness point that, that Howard was making? Uh, there's a, I mean, there's uh, uh, one, one risk might be that, uh, that, uh, that there are firms who should be caught by the regulation who are not. Um, and and, and uh, uh, I just note that the Stigler report on digital competition envisioned a two level regulatory structure that was quite interesting because there was one set of tighter regulations that applied to those companies effectively who had been designated. And then uh, a, a, another set of uh, uh, less arduous restrictions that would apply to, to all companies. And would that help to address the, the situation you're talking about, Amelia? I think it would, and actually, I think that the U.S. Stigler report was um, framed in a world that is very different to the EU. So I think actually quite a lot of what the Stigler report was aiming to put in place for the kind of second tier of uh, digital firms, we, offend, we essentially already have in the EU with things like the platform to business, with things like the GDPR, with things like actually just stronger competition and consumer enforcement and law. So there are things... I'm sure that we could do in all of those spaces to strengthen them. Um, but I think we, we eff effectively have that second run. Yeah, I mean, and ju ju just to point on that, there really is a fundamentally different framework. We, we don't obviously have an, in, we have a conceptual notion, but not a legal notion of dominance uh, in, the, in the United States. And that's a very important distinction because the threshold for monopolization, which is different from dominance, is considerably higher than what brings to bear uh, remedies and causes of action in Europe. So what I viewed as the, the sort of tier two of the Stigler report was in some sense compensating for that differential, plus all the other things that, that, that you listed, uh, Amelia. I think, I think that's an important uh, that, that, that's an important difference. And just one other little nuance I would interject. I mean, I, I think that there, I, I'm not sure it is the case that antitrust law in the US at least as currently conceptualized has, has failed in the sense that, you know, we can have a debate about whether or not it has missed certain things or not. But I think one of the things that we might stipulate is that even antitrust law completely correctly applied might not stop given the certain dynamics of some of these markets and some of these products, at very least market position. I wanna not say market power, but at very least very large market position. So a lot of the concern is about this very large market position and antitrust laws typically, at least as framed in the US, doesn't really concern itself with very large market position, um, unless you can really show it was improperly obtained. And I think a lot of the concern is that that market position, even if legally justifiably beneficially obtained, can become durable and prevent contestability. So I think about the DMA legislation and I think about regulatory proposals that are starting to percolate up in the US as well as legislative proposals to strengthen antitrust law as being about um, dealing with that problem of sustained bigness and ensuring that it does not squeeze out contestability. And that's a little bit of a different enterprise than the typical at least US antitrust 
um, sort of enterprise. So just want to mark that difference. I, I hesitate a little bit to talk about this as a failure of antitrust or antitrust agencies. We can have a debate about whether those have occurred, and I think it's a very legitimate and good debate. But I think we could be talking about the DMA even in the absence of such failures. Yeah, I think it's important also placed in the in the European context that, you know, I don't think the main problem is that antitrust rules or competition rules have failed. I think that the origin of the DMA is more uh, linked to processes, where you know I think there's a, a general you know agreement in Brussels that these cases take you know, too much time. Um, look at the Google cases. I mean, it took almost a decade to get the three decisions. By the time you get the decision, the market has moved on basically. And, and the remedies are very often dysfunctional or non-existent. Well, that may be a failure actually of the rules of the system. But I think, you know, a great part of the DMA is to provide for tools that could apply, you know, much faster then um, when you have to go through, you know, the whole discipline and, and you know, process of, of competition law, which is very, very slow. On, on um, Howard's point about, you know, maybe it's not fair to say that antitrust has failed in, in the US. I mean, just picking up on Damien's point there about speed. I mean, I gather FTC against Facebook is, is scheduled to go to court in 2023, autumn 2023. Um, Bill Kovacic said recently he thought it gets to the Supreme Court in 2026. I mean, whatever your objectives are, I don't see that that's a, a system that's working. And I think it is the same for, for Europe. Yeah, um, and so let's stipulate that there are procedural drawbacks to the common law adjudicative process by which we um, enforce antitrust in the U.S. I think that that's something that um, you know Bill Rogerson and I have recently written about. To be sure, um, that that is not a failure of enforcement against particular entities. That is a shortcoming of the system, and I think those are just two very different things. Um, and um, we don't need to split hairs over them. My point was that even if there hadn't been a failure of enforcement as to particular entities, we can ask whether the system uh, is achieving the objectives we want. And I see the DMA as with all of the flaws and I think rightly raised concerns about it um, as an effort to uh, shift the system to a new set of problems. And, and I think we want to be careful. I actually like the approach of, of expanding or shifting the system rather than distorting existing doctrines to uh, fix a problem where you may distort them beyond any recognition. So in some sense, I like the idea of a regulatory approach because it can be debated in and of itself without doing violence to, the, to a competition law system that at least from my standpoint, and I'm an old stick in the mud, but you know, by and large works very, very well with some shortcomings and some strengthening undoubtedly needed, speaking from the US perspective. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, let, let me put kind of one thing in there which I, where, where my discomfort always comes from. I, I basically agree with Howard and I, I also think that in some of those cases, it's, it's you do want regulation rather than something else than, than, than distorting kind of what we have and things that work well. But, but the, the procedural argument on this, that things have taken too long. Now, now some of these cases, for example, the, the, the first Google case, I, I know pretty well in its earlier stages. And I think the problem in this case of these delays, and I, I know this for a lot of the antitrust cases that I've seen, was that the doubts that there's actually a significant foreclosure effect of the behaviors that we've seen were very, very large at the start. And it's interesting how the, 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 that we've gone from foreclosure as the effect uh, to self-preferencing as a protective measure of not having to talk about foreclosure. And that reflects the difficulty, for example, in the shopping case, to actually come to a conclusion that that was actually very market distorting. And, and, and that, feeds my 
concerns to some extent, which doesn't mean that, that we don't have problems in other areas and so on and so forth. But if the, if the problem is that a lot of these things are very, very complex. We're basically saying we have identified problems in the concrete circumstances where they're coming up. It is the question of whether we actually know that there are always problems that are coming up with this. And, and we're now saying, okay, with Uber, we, we know it might not be a problem or they should not be caught. Uh, I, I think that's, that's a decision that's very, very hard to make uh, without actually get, uh, diving very, very deep into the technology and understanding the market in, in individual circumstances. And that tension will be there. And this, this, this means, um, you know, if you're going to per se rules, <laughs> which effectively this is, this is going back to basic, basically saying, uh, let's prohibit what we used to do bundling or something like this, right? And we know there's, there are going to be a lot of mistakes that are being made. And, and, we, and therefore, I also, I, mean, I reject this kind of, this is a failure of competition policy. It's a question of how much information you want to take into account to make good decisions, right? And, and I think that's the basis on, on which we really have to, have to argue. Okay, let's, let's move on to talk about those per se rules. Uh... Uh, COVID. Um, so, so we're going to talk about the obligations and I wanted to start with uh, some, some uh, uh, maybe over to you, Amelia, for, for a little bit of discussion about what those obligations are. And Damien, feel free to jump in on those as well. Okay, so I realize we're, we're running out of time because it's all too interesting. So I'll be very quick. I just wanted to say a little bit about the architecture around the obligations. So essentially there's two types of obligations. They're what, what was called blacklist. They're now called the Article 5 obligations and there's seven of those and they simply apply to relevant core, relevant core platform services with no further discussion as it were. Um, then there's 11 Article 6 obligations, that's what was called the grey list, and they are susceptible to further specification, and that specification process is set out in Article 7, and essentially um, the, the companies have to have measures that will meet the obligations. If the Commission thinks the measures taken aren't compliant, it can specify alternative measures but also the gatekeeper firms themselves can essentially ask the commission whether their proposed me measures uh, would be effective and would be compliant. And so what that creates is a kind of dis uh, a participative discussion between the gatekeeper and the commission to agree the measures that are going to be effective in uh, achieving the objectives of the obligation and proportionate, and I've underlined this bit, in the specific circumstances of the gatekeeper and the relevant services. And the real question is, I think, how much flexibility that gives the commission to, um, to specify these obligations in a way that really reflects the, the somewhat different business models of the gatekeepers. Just a few other notes, despite the specification process, at least currently it says you can be fined for breach from day one, that does seem a little bit odd if you're going through a process of kind of uh, good good faith specification, um, but that is what's there at the moment. There is a process for adding new obligations over time uh, following market a market investigation. There doesn't seem to be a process for removing obligations or amending obligations or for moving them between five and six, just new ones, but uh, maybe that will change as well. You can have an obligation suspended if a service is going to become non-viable in the EEA. Um, you can also be exempted on very narrow public interest grounds that are related to morality, uh, health or security, but there is no other objective justification possible except there is um, a small uh, a objective justification in respect of two of the obligations. Um, and I will just show the, if I can, how can I do this? Um, for some reason I can't, oh, there we are. So these are the actual obligations. I'm not going to talk through them, but just to highlight that they relate to a whole set of different aspects. So there's the things around tying stroke bundling and self-preferencing that Kaiuve was referring to. There's quite a lot that relate to data, data use and data sharing. 
there are elements that are about giving users, often particularly business users, but to some extent consumers, um, mobility to, to across different platforms. There are what measures around advertising transparency, both around the price that is paid and the performance of advertising. So obviously those are relevant to those uh, to advertising um, monetized um, platforms and gatekeepers. And then there are ones that are primarily about this kind of fair conduct. Um, so I think I should probably take them down, even though it might be useful to <laughs> refer to them. I don't know if people want to get their phone and take a picture so that then the, the ensuing conversation, <laughs> we can refer back to them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so just to, to, to start this off, uh, do you think there are any obligations on this list where you feel the obligation is inappropriate or excessive? Maybe I can pick on, on that. Um, I think, first of all, uh, I was a little bit surprised when I discovered the, the DMA proposal because, you know, there were lots of rumors and there were lots of talks by commission officials, uh, you know, during the months of October and November. And my understanding, um, you know, before I saw the proposal is that there would be a blacklist and a gray list. And the gray list would be more of a kind of menu with some obligations applying to some companies uh, and not others based essentially on their business model. And, and I like that, that approach because to me, it, it makes sense. I mean, there's a, you know, if you look at the obligations and you've been practicing competition law for 20 years, I mean, many of them are familiar to you, right? I mean, they, they're basically the issues that um, you know, arose in the context of um, complaints and, and investigations of, of the commission. So I, I think the, the big question for me is whether uh, the approach that has been proposed, which is essentially more to blacklist than a blacklist and a gray list. And it's true that Article 6, the list in Article 6, is a bit less black than the one in Article 5, but nevertheless, you know, they, 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 they would apply to all designated gatekeepers, will survive, or whether, you know, the commission, uh, well, not necessarily the commission, because now, of course, it's in the hands of the Council of Ministers and the Parliament, will sort of, you know, revert to a more, you know, grey list approach when it comes to, to Article 6. Um, and, yeah, I mean, that's my the main point I wanted to make on this one. Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, with some of these, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure whether we really understand the effect of whether it's a positive effect. So, so one of those things that I'm looking at and, and wondering, because we have, we have a benchmark for that, is for example, the high transparency degree on the edtech side, which, which if you're thinking about ad tech uh, as, as something that's like an, like an exchange also with, with financial exchanges, um, it's equivalent to basically requiring that you show the a full order book to, to both sides of the market. And we know that's, that's been very controversially discussed in the, in the academic literature. And it's not some, actually something that's not necessarily conducive uh, to the most competitive outcome, for example. So, uh, so that's kind of one, one, one of the examples that I see there. And I, have, you know, I, I, I haven't worked on ad tech whatsoever. Um, so uh, I don't know whether it's appropriate or not in the specific circumstances, uh, but it's something that I think is a, and uh, on this one, seems a very I, complicated problem. Kayuve, I've done a ton of work in ad tech and I can guarantee that to all the obligations, that's probably the one that make most sense. I mean, when you have, you know, a company that is the marketplace, but also trading on the buyer side and the seller side, some degree of transparency is really warranted. Uh, so then I can, I can assure you that it's, it's, it's a much needed uh, uh, provision. Okay. On the other what ones, I, I may have some more reserves, but that one is, is a good one. But that raises, so that just, sorry to interrupt, just um, one of the things that we found when we looked at ad tech is a big problem there, just the conflicts of interest, you know, which financial regulation is really good at, at just stopping you doing. Uh, and now that I think about it, I don't see anything on that in these rules on those basic conflicts of interest, which are, which is a real problem in ad tech. Yeah. 
Yeah, but that's that's then so 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 that's the not a transparency measure. That's that's actually a, 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 a separation of of activities issue, right? So 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 wouldn't you want to go in the direction of of, of financial regulation and, and mimic that in a in a strong to a stronger degree? So so that that's that's all I'm saying. I'm I'm, I'm not sure whether we're implementing the most adequate regulatory framework to that. Uh, I, I can see how everybody else would like to see absolutely everything. That, that I can see. Whether well, that's that's really the, the best resolution of the of the issues, I I'm just not sure. I don't. Yeah. So so one of the approaches here in in this uh, with the obligations is really to have a very rule based uh, uh, approach, um, and which certainly helps for enhancing clarity um, and uh, um, ensuring that the companies will know what is expected of them. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, the, the, the more uh, the, there's, there's a risk that in 10 years time, some of these rules will be really um, uh, not, uh, not so relevant as they are now. It's hard to know. If you, if, you were, if you were to go back 10 years in the past and say, what rules do you think we should have in this area of activity? Um, I'm not sure that the, this full list would have been uh, produced. And, and, and so that what we're, we're experiencing, I mean, we're looking at a, an industry that is experiencing very rapid change. And when, when you have rapid change, I mean, there's, there's a bit of an argument that uh, a principle-based approach may be more effective than a rule-based one in which the principles can, can last through time. Uh, um, you, you know, maybe I could go over so, to Mike and, and ask what's going on with the, the UK thinking on this. Okay. Um, so, I mean, so I, okay. I mean, one of the things that just slightly going back in the discussion to what is the obligations that have been missed out, you know, one is, and this may be a little bit orthogonal, but merger control. You know, if we actually think that one of the issues here is not just about avoiding the exploitation of current market power, but it's about opening up markets and increasing contestability competition in the longer run, then the lack of anything on mergers seems to quite a glaring omission. And I quite understand there may be some procedural process issues in the EU over that, but that's one place where I think the UK approach, where we're also applying the digital, the, the the digital markets unit is also going to be involved in mergers and we are changing the merger standard for dealing with some of these these mergers around around firms with strategic market status seems to be an important part of in the long run making sure that we over time are able to uh, undermine some of these issues then going specifically to your question sean you know about the sort of the flexibility and, and this is all very backward looking um I mean, I agree, you know, I mean, you, you look at that um, article five, you know, and you go down that list and you sort of 5A, okay, that's the Facebook Google case and 5B, that's Amazon MFNs and, you know, and it is all very backward looking and that's in the UK, we are not doing that. We are going for something which is much more bespoke to the individual firms and their particular activities, which have got SMS. How do how much of a difference this is in reality, I, I'm not actually sure about, because I think that goes very much to the point of how the commission is going to be able to update these over time. And, you know, Amelia made those points about, you know, removing amending objectives, moving from five to six and vice versa. I mean, I, I don't know what those are, but, you know, it seems to me that the ultimate decision on that sort of issue is going to be very important as to whether, Sean, your question highlights a real problem in the regime or just highlights something the regime needs to make sure they're focused on. Maybe we could move to Howard. And, and Howard, uh, how, how would you describe the process of specifying rules and the way it works in the, in the US, including the delegation of rulemaking? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's a, just a completely different system. And so the typical the typical thing that would happen here is you'd have a statute that provides some broad authorities and objectives and they would delegate the rulemaking to an agency and there are proposals to create a new agency here but one could also create one could also vest that authority more expressly in the federal trade commission which has uh, certain kinds of rulemaking authority that are now uh, somewhat debated 
and uncertain. Those could be made more sure. And then they would, they would sit down and they could typically um, would not, they, they might have a, a flexible framework that allows more of an adjudicative process where along the lines of the UK that Mike just outlined, there's a more bespoke kind of uh, set of obligations or commitments that are imposed on a particular uh, carrier, or they could go more broadly and impose these conditions um, ex ante on sort of a broad, more objectively specified category uh, of firms. Um, and there, there is a process which, you know, there's a cycle to, to, to put these regulations in place. It is more nimble than the legislative process, but not necessarily notably more nimble. So we do have problems of adjustment over time. And if you, know, if you look at what happened with the Telecommunications Act of 1996, within six months of passage of the act, a huge number of access regulations were put in place, most of which uh, in a very short period of time were sort of bypassed by events, yet remained on the books and remained um, hotly contested and putting lots of lawyers and economists to work long past the time that those provisions were arguably doing any work to uh, promote competition or restrain monopoly. So you raise a very good question about the institutional structure and the institutional setting. I think you need to have one where, to Cayuve's very early point in the discussion today, you have some kind of meaningful way to review success and assess success and determine whether or not the, the particular framework needs to change because what we would have done 10 years ago is very different from what we're doing today, presumably very different from what we would do 10 years from now. And you have to have a nimble enough process to either adjust on a bespoke basis or a systemic basis what those sets of obligations are. Um, in the US, the delegation process is slow, that's statutory. The adjustment process once delegation has been made to an agency can be faster, um, depending on how the statute is written and how uh, resourced the agency is. So uh, maybe one, uh, one idea would be that Article 7 might have more specification over what types of objectives might be taken into account when, when making new changes in the future. Yeah. I, think, I, I actually think one could make some of these default rules much more future-proof uh, and dynamic by basically making them the default, but allowing the firm to make a proposal to actually improve on it that still achieve, achieves the objective, but it feels that it can more efficiently fulfill it. Now, as long as, as the rule is the default, you know, this is, this is typical, you know, uh, Pareto improving bargaining at that. Okay. And I think we're, so, so the, 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 the very fixed review that we have that doesn't allow something like this, I think is a weakness and you could mm -hmm. really improve and actually also learn about the industry. And, and, and that's, I think the other, other important thing, the more engagement you have about the details, the more you learn about the industry, and the better the rules are going to get, and I think that is an element that's missing here, um, and and that 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 would be very simple, but could enormously improve, I think, the effectiveness and and the efficiency. Uh, yeah, of the, I could point to two real world. world examples from the U.S. experience that might be helpful in that regard. When in the in the wake of, uh, you know, telecom deregulation, particularly on the long distance side. There used to be this thing called long distance calling for those of you who, who, who might not remember that. Um, there was a big question about the access prices that long distance carriers would pay when they handed off their traffic to uh, local carriers. And this had always been regulated. And uh, what the FCC did was say, look, we're gonna set a price but if you all get around the table and negotiate something that everyone will agree to that you know, seems reasonable to us and reflective of all interests, we'll let that be in place. So there was actually a negotiated access price uh, result uh, somewhere around 94, 95, I don't remember exactly. Um, another example is how we do energy efficiency rules in the United States through the Department of Energy. It's negotiated rulemaking. There's a backstop where the department can come in and put in place 
sort of what they come up with out of their own head, but it tends to be negotiated uh, with the agency against that, uh, with the, uh, excuse me, the, the, the regulated entities against that back, backdrop, which allows nuance and real world considerations to come in. So I like that proposal. Yeah, I think I also agree with, with, with that proposal with one caveat is that, you know, I think that we should also avoid strategies of obfuscation. I, I mean, it's unavoidable that, you know, if you, if you try to involve uh, the designated gatekeepers uh, a little bit too heavily in the process, you might end up with never ending processes. And, you know, I think one of the reasons why you have this, 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 you know, set of rules that may appear a bit sort of, you know, rigid is because I think that one of the criticism that is made about competition law is that because the provisions of the treaty are very broad and quite vague, in fact, you know, it takes forever to interpret them to a given case. And here, since speed is really some, something that is that would be valued, you know, having a, a set of fairly specific rules yeah. would be helpful. I just would like also to, to make a quick point on what uh, Mike said about mergers. I think the reason why you know you've got nothing about mergers and you've got nothing about what used to be called the new competition tool, which is now the debt competition tool, is is one of legal basis. Uh, it, it was not clear to the Commission that the Commission would have the powers, at least under Article 114, to start you know uh, reinventing uh, uh, competition law. So I think it's really on purpose and for legal reasons that the the competition part of the proposal has been sidelined. Can I just come in on the new competition tool uh, point, which is clearly uh, very largely true that it's dead, but there is a bit of it that's still live, which is that you can use market investigations both to add new core services, new obligations and new criteria, I think. But an, a further thing that you can potentially do with a market investigation is you can find systematic non-compliance with a rule and then require structural break up. Um, and I think that's quite interesting because that is one of the things that the Commission, I think, was keen to get out of the new competition tool. I think, A, there's a question of whether they'll actually ever use it. Um, but B, I think, and going to Mike's earlier point about the CMA and the ad tech chain, it's not, it's not obvious that you only ever want to use the structural tool where there has been systematic non-compliance with a rule because actually in the ad tech chain um, the CMA said this is a situation where there is such an inherent conflict of interest that structural measures may well be justified they didn't go as they hadn't done enough work to say they were justified but certainly that they may well be justified but there isn't an obvious rule that you would put in there that it could then be non-complied with that would then get you to the structural breakup so yeah. I'm not sure that bit quite works yeah and, and just a, a point on that I mean you're putting in place the trigger for structural breakup in some sense before one knows whether structural breakup even would work, is even technologically feasible and would actually in the end be in the public interest. So, so I do think that there has to be a bit of a, you know, it's hard to sort of trigger that as too automatic a presumption. Um, and, and just one point that, you know, we have to think about is anytime you start to get into a negotiating you know, negotiating sort of more tailored situations here, you always have to always have to worry about regulatory capture. So just one point that I that I would note is any of these sort of solutions when they go beyond sort of clear legislative, you know, sort of dictates or clearly, you know, uh, specified things in the legislation, you know, some kind of public comment process is, I think, vital, so that we don't get you know, Damian pointed to obfuscation, but we don't get a sort of, um, you know, uh, a captured agency or captive entity at a particular time cutting a deal that then people have to live with. So some kind of, um, you know, public oversight on an ongoing basis anytime some, there's a departure um, is, 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 I think, a significant part of any healthy process. Great. I think there is another pro a process thing that I'm slightly worried about here, 
well, quite a lot worried about, which is actually just the practicality of the doing effective specification in the time scales that the commission is talking about. And I think for some of these, it's fairly straightforward, even 6B, you know, they're not absolutely specified, but they're fairly well specified. For others, it's really not straightforward to do in a short time at all. So if things like providing real time data portability, that in the UK was a possibility as a pro-competitive in intervention where the CMA would do a market study and think about actually what sort of data portability, what data wants porting, in what way. Um, uh, I think there is, I mean, there's so much data and so much data that could be ported in so many different ways that I'm. That seems to me to require an awful lot of specification and a whole process of API design, etc. cetera, um, that it's, it doesn't really sit as nice as neatly here as some of the other provisions for me. Okay, let's move on to uh, enforcement now. Um, and uh, uh, maybe it would make sense to start by asking uh, uh, Damien, for example, if you could just uh, quickly summarize uh, the enforcement side of these rules. Thank you, thank you, Sean. So, if you look at the um, at at articles, let's say twenty and following, that essentially deal with enforcement, there is a lot of familiarity with Regulation One Two Thousand and Three. Um, you know, with with the investigative powers that will be given uh, to the Commission, uh, the possibility to adopt interim measures. Uh, there is a commitments procedure that is there, uh, there is a possibility to adopt non-compliance decision, a possibility to adopt fines, and then there is a due process that is guaranteed with the right to be heard and access to the file. So it seems that the apparatus of Regulation 1-2003 has been sort of cut and pasted uh, to, uh, to uh, this, this regulation. Now, I'd like to make two observations, which in my view are quite, quite fundamental. I mean, I think the first one is that um, there is no complaint procedure. Um, that's a little odd if, if you think about it, right? So it's, it's for the commission to basically seize itself and investigate a case. Now, um, if there's no formal uh, complaint procedure, that, well, then you may have an informal one where, you know, basically uh, uh, victims of uh, bad behaviors will basically try to reach out to the commission one way or another uh, in order to explain uh, what their problems are. So I would feel infinitely more comfortable with a formal complaint process than what is likely to be an informal one. So that's point number one. The second point that I want to make is that I was a little bit surprised when I saw the, uh, the, the regulation that is, you know, literally no role for the national authorities. Um, you know, there, there's an advisory committee where they may have a say, but I would have expected, especially since the enforcement, you know, apparatus looks very much like regulation one, 2003, to have had some sort of co-enforcement approach with the commission taking the lead and then some national competition authority. So, I mean, talking to people, some of them say, no, 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 no. It should be in the hands of the commission because most of these platforms have EU-wide activities. They operate across markets. So it makes no sense uh, to uh, have uh, enforcement at the local level. On the other hand, in competition law, one of the advantages of having national competition authorities is when you were told, as is often the case, I would say 90% of the time, by the commission, oh, we're very busy, we have priorities, I'm afraid that we, we cannot really help. Well, then to go to the French competition authority, the German competition authority, which were very keen and, and in fact, very well equipped to deal with these cases. So I think I'm, I'm a little bit worried about the enforcement process. And that's my final point, especially because if you look at uh, uh, the recitals, uh, the commission is providing for 80 full-time equivalent, which will not be near enough uh, to deal with this beast, uh, which is this, this proposed regulation. 
Okay. Well, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe one comment on, on Damien. I, I, I'm very sympathetic to, to what he's saying about the compliance process. Um, I think an informal compliance process uh, that you inevitably are, are going to have is problematic. And, and that's because I, I think uh, Howard mentioned regulatory capture. That doesn't just come from the regulated firms that today comes very strongly also from the other side. And we kind of know that even in these processes that we've had on legislation, uh, the, the political power of some of uh, the firms who are interested in the regulation and in the decisions is actually pretty strong in Europe. So, so I think um, we really have to think hard on, on regulatory capture on both sides. And so formalizing the process, uh, making sure it doesn't go uh, primarily through the political uh, sphere uh, is actually a very important part of this. It, I, I disagree a bit from, from taking this away from, from the European level. We, we really have every firm that you can think of that might fall under it, even the ones um, that some of us think shouldn't fall under it. I think they're at that level where you do want to have central decision making. I think we've had problems with this uh, in the context where we've had antitrust decisions that, that actually varied across different jurisdictions, but were essentially on the same business model and even the same firms. And I think we don't want to replicate that here. The number of cases in a sense uh, isn't large enough relative to that, that we should really risk that. Um, I think if we have regulation, it should be uniform because otherwise we're, we're generating a lot more cost. I wanted to say something actually very similar, which is I, you have to have the enforcement bit of this regulation in order for it to bite. But if it's working properly, you shouldn't actually end up having too much enforcement. And I think that's completely different to competition law where it works through enforcement. Ex ante regulation, really, it should be a big stick really used. So I think it's good. I, I think it's it should be absolutely fine for the commission uh, to do this myself. Okay. Uh, are these, I mean, are these powers uh, exclusive to the commission and necessarily no member state can implement its own separate rules? Um, and uh, I mean, it, it, at the same time, you can have some companies that are not uh, multi operating in multiple states that uh, that might be doing things that are equivalent to what would be of concern by the European Commission rules. You can still obviously have national competition authorities taking competition cases and mm -hmm. through a very um, I'd say slightly blurry bit of wording, the German amendment to competition law that effectively carries out regulation is treated as competition law regulation is therefore allowed to go through. So I guess it would be open to every other nation, every other member state to introduce something like the German quasi regulation alongside the central regulation. I don't think that would be a good outcome myself, but it, it seems to be possible yeah. with- Okay, thank you. thank you very much. We're gonna to have to close this out right now. It's been a great discussion. I really appreciate uh, all the speakers who've joined us and the audience who's been uh, really loyal throughout, uh, throughout this session. Uh, on the behalf of the CCP, thank you all very much. I just note that uh, for the record, some of us have, have worked for, for private companies who are involved with this space. So we, I think that should be stated. Um, and also uh, uh, some of us have not recently done so, so that's also worth we're stating. So, uh, but I think, uh, I think we've had a discussion that, that goes back to many of our fundamental views and it's really been an interesting one. So thank you all very much. Take care. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.